Good morning. Welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna, episode 158. Do you believe it? Uh, my name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service, which has four archive centres across the Highlands of Scotland, in Inverness, in Fort William, in Portree, and in Wick, and together we look after the historic documents for the Highlands of Scotland. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland, and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we really, really are grateful for that. It enables us not only to do our statutory duties, uh, which we are obviously required to do, but also to extend the range of what we're able to do to different audiences and so on. So uh, we really are grateful for any donations you're able to give to support the service. This week, as I mentioned, is pre-recorded because I am in the Archive Centre uh, arranging a visit for Inverness Men's Shed, who are coming in today to have a look at what we do. Um, this week we are looking at a subject which is always popular, so something that I have touched on in different episodes and using some of our most frequently used collections, the police records. And for this episode I'm looking specifically at police records relating to Caithness. So thank you to Jennifer and the team at Nucleus who have done a power of work in giving me some examples from the Caithness records. As I've said before, it's not as easy for me to get my hands on the records in the other offices as, as easily as it is for me to do the Inverness ones. So I'm always grateful when my colleagues are able to support me with that. So let's start with a little bit of an overview of early policing in Scotland from the Scottish Archive Network. If any of you are interested in, in looking at an overview of a subject, Scottish Archive Network has a really useful knowledge base on its website. So let's start by looking, first of all, at borough police forces. The earliest form of policing in Scotland was the duty of watch and ward, carried out by burgesses in boroughs from at least the 12th century until the local and national police acts of the 19th century. Several towns, notably Edinburgh, augmented this with an armed town guard in periods of crisis. In the second half of the 18th century, several boroughs attempted to improve policing by obtaining local acts of parliament to empower forms of local taxation to pay for watching and other functions. In 1800, Glasgow was the first borough to establish a police force on modern lines. Several other boroughs obtained local acts to establish police forces soon after 1800, and by 1833, a series of general police acts permitted any existing royal borough to establish a police system with additional powers covering cleansing, etc., without the need for a local act of parliament. The General Police Scotland Act 1850 extended the power to become a police borough to places with a population of over 1,200, so you no longer needed to be an existing borough, you could apply to become a police borough. The General Police and Improvement Scotland Act 1862 reduced the minimum population for the creation of a police borough to 700. In 1892, the Borough Police Act ended the overlap and the sometimes conflict that had existed between borough councils and police commissioners in boroughs by restricting powers to either one or the other. And only those boroughs with 7,000 or more inhabitants were allowed to keep their police forces, and new forces were restricted to boroughs with a population of over 20,000. Police commissioners were abolished by the Town Councils Act 1900, which replaced them and borough councils with a single town council in each case. So you can see there, as, as we often see, the difference between counties and boroughs and the important role that boroughs have played in, in the uh, privileges and things that, that happen within a borough that might not happen out with. And so you can see there that it started in about the 12th century through a, a watching brief, basically, um, and then how that changed and developed as our towns and cities and boroughs changed. So that's what happened in the urban or the more populated uh, centres or the boroughs. What about those vast swathes of Scotland that weren't borough towns? Well, this is how the Scottish Archive Network describes the evolution of the county forces. County constabularies. From the 17th century until the mid 19th century, justices of the peace, JPs, were empowered to appoint two constables in each parish 
whose duties included attending quarter sessions, reporting crimes and serving warrants. The funding for this was supposed to come from the rogue money collected by the commissioners of supply in each county, but parish constables were not well funded and the work was unpopular. By 1800, a few counties were experimenting with chief constables and county constabularies. The Rural Police Scotland Act 1839, which allowed commissioners of supply to make an additional assessment for establishing and maintaining a constabulary, led to the setting up of several county constabularies. But reform of county policing throughout Scotland did not occur until the Police Scotland Act of 1857, which compelled all counties in Scotland who had not already done so to establish and maintain a police force. County police forces were administered by a police committee or a constabulary committee, made up of commissioners of supply, the Lord Lieutenant of the county and the Sheriff of the county. The Local Government Scotland Act 1889 transferred the powers of the former police committees or constabulary committees of the commissioners of supply to stand in joint committees. These were composed of equal numbers of county councillors and commissioners of supply and the Sheriff Principal. These were in turn abolished by the Local Government Scotland Act 1929, which placed supervision of county constabularies under police committees of county councils. Now, I'm very conscious that I've said a lot of the same words over and over again, but fundamentally, that gives an idea of the evolution of policing across Scotland and again illustrates, as I said, how different the story of the borough is from from the 12th century onwards with that development of of a watching brief compared to the counties, which is much later, and how those two evolved and overlapped. And you can imagine how that would work very well initially, but soon we start to have overlaps and who's got the remit of this and where do boundaries end and so on. So that gives an overview of policing. Let's now turn to Caithness specifically. Wick Borough had the first official force in the area, starting in 1840. Thurso Borough followed a year later in 1841, and it was also in 1841 that the first county-wide police force in the area, the Caithness Constabulary, was started. After the Police Scotland Act 1857, which I mentioned there, that was really a key piece of legislation, meaning that if you didn't already have a police force, you were now obliged to have one in the county. After that Police Scotland Act of 1857, the two borough forces joined the county constabulary. But in 1863, Wick Borough Police separated from Caithness Constabulary and they um, remained apart as a separate force until rejoining some 10 years later. In an interesting twist, Pulteney Town, which is not a borough but is, is um, well, I think now part of Wick, um, followed special legislation which enabled it to set up its own force in 1845 and remain separate until 1902, which is quite interesting. If we jump forward, in 1969, the Caithness Constabulary amalgamated with the forces of Zetland and Orkney to become the first Northern Constabulary with the headquarters in Wick. There was a further merger with other Highland Constabularies in 1975. What a year of 1975! changes. Um, And that created a much bigger force again called the Northern Constabulary. And that was the force that was um, around for all of my childhood. It was, we had that Northern Constabulary, not the original one. And this mass merging that happened in 1975 was happening across Scotland with all borough, county, uh, county and other forces being replaced by eight police forces. Northern, Strathclyde, Lothian and Borders, Grampian, Tayside, Fife, Central and Dumfries and Galloway. So we've gone from all those kind of bitty bits of policing through uh, in different different and different areas to coming through to this point in 1975 where we have those forces. And then in 2013, as many of you will remember and no doubt there will be some comments on, all of these were amalgamated to become one force, Police Scotland. So that's the structural sort of admin side of policing in Scotland and the policing particularly in Caithness. But what about the records? What do these records tell us about everyday life? Well, we have police records in all four of our offices, staffing records, uh, chief constables, annual reports, memoranda, letter books, records of crimes and offences and various others. 
And as I mentioned, they are very beloved by researchers, by locals. They are very commonly used. But we're going to be looking at some of the police records that are most frequently used and requested by researchers, by historians and all sorts of people. Let's start with a record whose, which ref, whose reference number is CNC11, Officer's Default Book, 1859 to 1890. We hold various staffing records across our offices, but this is the only Officer's Default Book held in nucleus in the Caithness archives. These volumes are incredibly interesting. They're very useful for anyone who is interested in tracing or uncovering the story of a specific police officer. So quite often people will come in with a family history inquiry or because they're studying the history of a place and they want to know about the local police officer at a certain time. These default books record each police officer with a detailed physical description. They note each of their transfers and record any, men um, any mentions of meritorious acts or promotions, as well as any offences or misconduct. They make for very, very interesting reading. The first officer listed in this default book in Nucleus is John Swanson, who was appointed Sergeant to Wick on the 7th of July, 1843. Swanson is recorded in the volume as having a fair complexion, blue eyes and black hair. He was five foot ten inches. And as I say, police records are great for giving you a physical description that you might not get otherwise. When that book starts in 1859, John Swanson was 46 and it notes that he was previously a labourer before joining the police force. His record shows some um, recurring discipline issues. On the 13th of July, 1859, he's listed as being drunk when at, the Ac when at Ackergill investigating a case of sheep stealing, reported by Sir George Dunbar, um, Baronet of Hempbriggs. His punishment on that occasion was to be reduced to a PC of the first class and sent to Watton, where he went in August, 1859. However, in November of that year, so just a few months later, his record shows drunk when at market at Wick, reported by the chief constable. Imagine, imagine if you're, you're going to do something wrong, you really don't want it to be in front of your chief constable, I would imagine. This time he was suspended for three weeks with no pay before being reinstated on the recommendation of the police committee. For the next two years, Swanson's record is clean, but in 1861, an entry notes that he had been the worse for liquor at Wick on the 20th current reported by Andrew Colvin, merchant. This time he was required to pay a fine of five shillings, which is about a day's wages. But there is a note on against his record saying, this is the last time that any offence of a similar nature will be overlooked. And on the 7th of March, 1862, he was again found to be drunk at Wick while on duty, reported by Sergeant G. Swanson and Chief Constable. And he was allowed to resign at four weeks. So perhaps not the most glorious of police careers, but he stayed longer than one Peter Mackay. Peter Mackay was appointed on the 12th of May, 1862, as a constable in the Thurso. The details are filled out as usual. He was aged 29 in 1833. They note that's obviously the last time his age has been, um, they've been aware of it. Blue eyes, a fresh complexion, dark brown hair, height five foot nine. But below that, it says there's only one entry under his uh, under Peter Mackay's section. This person, after being appointed, went south and never entered upon his duty. So he obviously just took the job and then disappeared. A very, very short lived time to take up a whole page in the register. Much like uh, the entry for 24 year old Samuel Ferguson, who was a native of Airdrie in Lanarkshire, who was appointed sergeant at Wick in February 1868. He also has only one note on his record. He asked and obtained leave to go to Edinburgh to bring his wife and did not return, but joined the Linlithgowshire Constabulary, from which he was dismissed upon it being ascertained how he left Caithnessshire, dis uh, dismissed for desertion. So you can find stories within these of misconduct. We can also find some really interesting little side comments against individual officers' details. So, for instance, Arthur Taylor was 
suspended for allowing a prisoner to escape on the 23rd of March 1872, resigned 5th of April 1872. It notes that he was a steady but a careless constable. And that comment on character can be seen on other officers' entries as well. For instance, William Mackay, a good, steady, intelligent constable. John Rind, a steady man but deficient in action. William Campbell, an indifferently good constable. But my favourite was one that my colleague Jennifer sent me with a reflection saying, isn't this rather worrying? There's a comment against Alexander Gunn which just said, a steady man, but hardly sane in my opinion. A little bit concerning. But before I move on to a second sort of record, I wanted to make it clear that of course, many officers had no misconduct recorded against their names and had merits, promotions, meri meritorious acts, and so on recorded. Constable Thomas Sinclair, a native of Caithness, was appointed a constable in May 1865 at the age of 20. Thomas Sinclair spent his first few years as a constable in May, Thurso, Leibster and Ray before settling in Pulteney Town and Wick. On the 28th of April 1873, Thomas Sinclair was promoted to a sergeant and five years later in August 1878 to inspector. On the 27th of June 1884, he was promoted to chief constable, a role that he would hold for the next 28 years until his retirement in 1912, and there are no offences or misconduct references against his name at all in all of that long career. So you can find fascinating stories, stories of um, misconduct, of errors, of errors of judgment, stories of extraordinary police officers serving their community. So those are examples from the personnel records like I say, a treasure trove of information about the people who made the Caithness Police Service function. But the next type of record we're going to look at is the one that is most commonly used and most uh, beloved by staff and researchers alike. We're going to look at a police occurrence book and the example we're going to look at is NC 113, which is the 1913 to 1919 occurrence book for Caithness Constabula County Constabulary. Occurrence books, if you've never come across them, are kind of much like school logbooks, but for the police. Um, they're records which are kept regularly. School logbooks are weekly, but police occurrence, daily occurrence books tend to be daily, um, with entries detailing work undertaken, distances travelled, any um, crimes or incidents that have been reported or investigated. So they're full of information about life in that particular area. They're full of stories, um, both serious and light-hearted. I'm going to look really solely at um, light-hearted stories initially because some of the stories in there, there are references to suicides, there are references to, uh, to serious crimes, very distressing crimes. So I'm going to look at the more light-hearted end of that scale. Have a listen to this extract, along with Jennifer's thoughts about it, about a, th a theft that was recorded on the 27th of March 1919. The first report we're going to look at is from the 27th of March 1919, where the alleged theft of two bed street of two bed sheets. I'll try that again. The first report is from the 27th of March 1919, where the alleged theft of two bedspreads is reported by PC James McCallan from May. The bedspreads belonged to Annie Banks or Barnetson of Mill of May, Canisby, and were reported stolen from a bleaching green. She said that she put a washing out to bleach on the green located about 80 yards from her house and checked on them around 7pm that evening. Everything was as it should be. She checked the washing again around 10pm as the wind had risen and then discovered that two bedspreads were missing. The report goes on to say that around 9pm a neighbour girl had seen a tall man standing near the washing before heading off in the direction of Loch Scarfskerry, but she did not see his face. Inquiries had been made by the police but no trace of the missing bedspreads could be found. What is most interesting about this report is that a full description of the bedspreads is given at the end, which is quite detailed. One was a white muslin bedspread with diamond pattern crochet and fringe about eight inches long at one side. 
The other was of white cotton, with crochet of honeycomb pattern and fringed all around, darned at one side near the fringe. And Jen has gone on to note, it's likely, of course, that the woman who reported these bedspreads missing was the one who made them and provided the details to the police to better trace them. How many of us nowadays would be able to provide such a detailed description were we able to pick out our own from the many identical patterns that are now available to buy, especially as we are more likely to replace any once they tear rather than darn them as would have been the case in 1919. So you can see there not only the sort of things that the police are occupied with, and I know many current police officers who would love to have time to investigate um, two missing bedspreads, but just the social history that you can get in, in there, as Jen has referenced. Another theft, which might seem um, slightly strange to us now, was reported on the 15th of November 1916 to PC Alexander Gunn of Wick. The theft of a rubber doormat taken from the door of the Station Hotel, Thurzo Street, Wick. When knew it had cost 17 and 6, inquiries were made, but all to no avail. And it's easy, I think, to laugh about these things or smile about them now. But I also think we need to remember that these entries were written during the war. Um, no one wanted to waste or lose anything unnecessarily. And incidentally, just referencing the war there, the Caithness police records are full of references to conflict. The huge impact of the First and Second World War on the Caithness coastline are very, very visible throughout these records. And they, they are in most police records, but particularly so, I think, in Caithness because of that proximity to or the extent of the coastline and, and the fact that it's at the edge. Of course, many crimes then and now are um, opportunistic, as those two sound, the bedspreads and the rubber doormat, but some are much more conniving. On the 29th of April 1919, PC Donald Sutherland recorded the crime of obtaining shoes by fraud. Have a listen to this entry. On the 29th of August 1919, PC Donald Sutherland, Wick, reports that around 4pm a woman between 35 and 40 years old went into the boot shop on Union Street, Wick, and asked for a pair of women's shoes similar to a pair shown on display in the window. The assistant, Annie Mackenzie Mackay, got them for her and told her that the price was 26 shillings. The woman then told her that the shoes were for Rosebank House and that she would be back to pay for them in a while if they were suitable or return them if not. She did not return with either payment or shoes. The assistant hadn't taken her name or address and there was no trace of her at Rosebank House. Her description is given of, as about five foot four inches, hair dark, wore a cream colour blouse, black hat and navy blue jacket with one row of white or cream coloured pearl buttons down at the front. When I read that, I was like, that's such a textbook um, example of a con to just be like, I'll just, I'll be right back to pay for these, okay? Um, just interesting to read that, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago, that very similar thing was, was happening. So far I've spoken about theft, but there are various other types of, of crime reported in these books, as I mentioned. So, for instance, on the 5th of September 1918, at around 6pm, Chief Constable William K. Cormack was proceeding on duty to Holkirk on his motorcycle when he accidentally collided with a dog. Mr John Todd of Dale, Holkirk, was driving a horse and trap in the same direction as the Chief Constable was heading. He had a dog running after the trap. In order to allow the motorcycle to pass him, he moved to the side of the road and slowed to a walk. Just as the chief constable was approaching the trap, the horse stopped and the dog ran out in front of the motorcycle. The chief constable tried to swerve to avoid hitting the dog, but was unable to, and the front wheel hit the dog, causing him to be thrown onto the road. His injuries are described as being a bruise on the left knee, injuries to his right hand and shoulder, and a lacerated wound and bruise to the left eyebrow. The motorcycle was practically undamaged and he was able to return to Wick to get his injuries treated by Dr Wright. It doesn't mention any injury to the dog or to the owner, so we assume that they're both all right or that it just didn't matter enough to be written down. Um, the first time I read it through, I assumed that the injuries, it describes the dog and then it says the injuries were this, this and this. Was that the dog's injuries? But it was the chief constable's injuries. 
So that ended comparatively well, um, certainly for the Chief Constable, but not all accidents did. This is an entry from the 30th of October 1915, um, well timed I think in the run up to bonfire night to remind us of the dis public service announcement, to remind us of the danger of all rockets and fireworks. This report by PSN Mackenzie Wick is about a non-fatal explosion in the north of Scotland and Orkney and Shetland Steam Navigation Company office at Harbour Quay, Wick. On the 30th of October 1915 at around 6pm, Frank Robb Wick, age 19, and James Sutherland Wick, age 17, both clerks of the Steamboat Company, were in the office. A considerable time before, some rockets which belonged to the steamer St Nicholas, which came ashore in 1914, were taken to the office by Mr Henderson, steamboat agent. One of the rockets had been opened by one of the company's servants and the gunpowder and other contents thought to be all removed. You can already see where this is going, Jen had mentioned to me. Rob held up the rocket and after looking inside it, he thought it was probably quite harmless and threw it on the fire. About three minutes later, an explosion occurred which blew the fire grate to pieces and smashed the windows in the office. Rob got off very lightly, only having been struck on the cheek by a fragment of the fire grate. But James Sutherland was cut about both eyes and legs, and one of his eyes was very severely damaged. So as I say, I feel like I'm doing that as a public service announcement now. It's nearly bonfire night. Be careful with fireworks. Finally, we're going to look at the report by our, our report by Inspector Mackenzie Wick from the 19th of July 1919. This report tells the story of a fire which broke out at Donald Alexander Ware's fish curing business in Albert Street in Wick, causing around £4,000 worth of damage with items, many items, completely destroyed. That works out at somewhere around £115,000 worth of damage today. And here's the report. Around 6.50am, James Cormack cattle dealer, Harrow Road, Wick, saw a lot of smoke coming from a kippering kiln in the fish curing yard owned and occupied by Donald Alexander Wares. He at first thought a new fire had been put on top of the, a new fire had been put on in the kiln, but a few hours later, he saw a few minutes later, he saw a heavy black smoke rising from it, and that smoke was coming in through the windows of the fish house and the wood chip house attached to the kiln. He then heard the cracking of burning wood and found that the place was on fire. He informed John Bain, firemaster, and Mr. Wears and George Cormack Cooper before returning to the yard where the fire had since spread to the adjoining Kippering kiln occupied by Hugh Carter. The local fire brigade were called out and attempted to quell it, but the fire spread rapidly and before it was finally put out, the office, the kiln, the fish house, the chip house and the cooperage, as well as a large amount of kipper boxwood, the usual kippering plant attached to the kiln, barrel wood and some salt and barrels of cured herring, all property of Donald Alexander Wares, had been completely destroyed. The adjoining yard of Hugh Carter, the kiln and the fish house were completely burnt as well as well as a considerable amount of stock, including wood, barrels and kippering plant. The fire had also spread to the next property, a cooperage and store owned by Messrs Davidson Peary and Company, fish curers of Leith, and onto their neighbouring cooperage owned by Mr Alexander Plett, fish curer Wick. They were all completely burnt, with all the fish curing plant and herring barrels stored in them. Luckily, the cooperage and kiln occupied by Hugh Carter and Mrs Davidson Perry and Company are the property of Alexander Weir Senior, Wick, and the premises were covered by insurance. Unfortunately, the stock is only partially covered and some of the stock destroyed is not insured at all. It's believed that the fire started by accident in Donald Alexander Weir's kiln. On the evening before, he was kippering her herrings in his kiln, with the last fire being put out about 6.30pm. Mr Wares and Mr Joseph McBeath, his night smoker, were in the kiln until about 10 or 11pm that night, and the fire in the kiln was smoking but almost burnt out. Mr Wares locked up the yard and went home. Hugh Carter in the neighbouring yard had put out his last fire around 9pm, and about 10pm all the workers had left his yard, 
shortly followed by Mr Carter, who locked up and didn't see anything unusual. It's noted that about three weeks prior, the woodwork around one of the windows in Mr Ware's kiln had caught fire during smoking operations, but had been quickly extinguished before any damage was done. The fire reported had probably started in the same way, as while the Kippering kilns were stone-built with corrugated iron roofs, the cooperages and stores were built of wood and stone. What's interesting at the end of that extract is it lists all the witnesses along with their addresses and their occupations. I'm going to stop telling stories there. And as always, when I'm pre-recorded, I manage to keep my time much better. Um, there are always more stories from the police records and doubtless I will do another episode of police records from one of our offices in the future. If you want to have a look at them, please do drop into any of our archive centres to have a look at that, that area's police records. If you want to particularly see the ones at Nucleus, then of course just go in during opening hours, but also archive afternoons, which are held every Wednesday afternoon at Nucleus. They are often police records out to look at then as well. So please do just drop in and have a browse through them. I hope you have enjoyed my usual sentence, sorry. I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing some of these stories. Uh, I hope that it's um, been, been of interest. I hope that Dave Connor, who is the police expert uh, and, and a very uh, active member of Inverness Local History Forum. Dave, I hope you're happy with my summary of the Caseness police records. If you've got loads of uh, things I've said wrong, let me know. Um, next week, again, it will be pre-recorded, but for next week, we're going to the other end of the Highlands. We're going from Wick to Loch Aber for the McCall collection, which is held in our Loch Aber Archive Centre. So I hope you can join me next week. As I say, again, it will be pre-recorded. But a reminder for now that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. The High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards the service and help us with our work, then we'd be very, very grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs>